Hi everyone. Sorry I can't be with you today. Uh, I think it's probably about 2 a.m. here in Canberra at the moment. Uh, I'm, hopefully I'm awake uh, and hopefully I'm sitting on Twitter keeping an eye on things so feel free to tweet at me at any stage or ask me a question on Twitter and I'll do my best to respond. I'm rag on Twitter. In the aftermath of World War II, Australian hopes for a new era of national progress were expressed in a massive engineering project called the Snowy Mountain Scheme. The project promised new reserves of water and electricity to power development of Australia's inland. Rivers were diverted, towns were relocated, and new reservoirs were created. Over 145 kilometres of tunnels were carved through the granite peaks of Australia's Great Dividing Range. Finally completed in the 1970s, the Snowy Mountain Scheme was an engineering marvel. But this symbol of national pride would not have been possible without the labours of thousands of new Australians drawn from across Europe. Some were recruited because of their skills, others were plucked from displaced persons camps and offered the chance of a new life. As long, of course, as they were prepared to work where the Australian government wanted them to. The human and environmental costs of the projects are still debated, but the Snowy Scheme is regularly invoked as the country's prime nation-building project, an example of what can be achieved together through vision, leadership and toil. Why am I talking about this today? Well, I suppose it's a great chance to say, hey Europe, thanks for all the people. But it's also because I wanted to highlight the mythic qualities of the mega project, the cultural power that resides in the big idea that promises to set us upon a path toward the future. We are here today because we are embarked upon ambitious undertakings. Our projects aim to reshape the cultural landscape. We're building pipelines and reservoirs we're moving massive amounts of data across countries across the world. But, as we've tried to show, these large-scale efforts are only possible because of many smaller local contributions. The Snowy Scheme was built by individuals fleeing the disruptions of war. They took a risk in the hope of something better. It's important for us to reflect on the contributions and motivations of our communities, our partners and our users. A big idea isn't enough. You probably all know that as well as metadata from libraries, museums, archives and universities, Trove provides access to more of almost 150 million full text digitised newspaper articles. The OCR text of the articles is fully searchable, but of course it suffers from the usual errors and inaccuracies. Fortunately, Trove users have been eager to help. Anyone can jump in and correct the OCR output, and they do. More than 150 million lines of text have been corrected so far. Our top corrector, and yes, we do have a scoreboard, has corrected more than 3 million lines of text by himself. Recently I've been thinking about this work and the limitations of language around online engagement. Our correctors are more than users. Contributors, perhaps, or volunteers. But all of these words seem to place correctors on the other side of the interface as clients rather than builders. When you think about it, each correction is a tweak of our search index. It changes the way the back end functions, increasing the efficiency of the system by getting people to the things they're interested in more quickly. So perhaps we should call our correctors discovery engineers. The mythic mega project maintains a sense of otherness. It is exceptional, an achievement above and beyond the realms of ordinary experience. But this obscures the many small acts of commitment and cooperation that make it possible. 
These are the expressions of ordinary lives. The routine and repetitive, alongside moments of great passion and meaning. The success of our projects will ultimately depend not on the speed of our servers or the cleanliness of our code, but on the interactions that emerge as our aggregations become part of the simple business of living. People correct our newspapers for many reasons, but few of these motivations are likely to align with our own strategic objectives. It's not just corrections either. More than 80,000 comments and 3 million tags have been added to resources in trouble. The tags are just plain text tags and we make no effort to control their content. And it creates some interesting possibilities. I wonder whether you can guess the meaning of our most heavily used tag. You can see it there. It's L-R-R-S-A and it's attached to more than 16,000 items. Any ideas? It's actually an acronym that stands for the Light Rail Research Society of Australia. Members of the society use the tag in order to share material that's of interest. So the tag has become a means of collaboration. Another popular tag you can see there is TBD, or simply to be done. And this one's used by text correctors to manage their own workflows. The numerous guises of a simple tag illustrate the value, I think, of underspecified tools, of leaving functionality open to ad hoc collaboration. The boundaries between system and use is fluid. Tagging behaviour can extend system functionality, from machine to human and back again. The limits of what is possible are open to negotiation and change. Now, my favourite example of this is the work of one man who has been identifying out of copyright sheet music on Trove. He's not a musician, but he uses his computer to create performances of the pieces. And he then uploads the performances to YouTube or SoundCloud and adds a link to them in a comment on Trove. So what that means is that people who find these works now on Trove can just click on the link to hear them. The functionality of the system has been extended without a single line of code being written. But the permeability of these boundaries means that we can't take the roles of people and machines as given. Five years ago, crowdsourced text correction was a cost-effective solution to the vagaries of OCR. But as technology improves, do we continue to ask humans to undertake tasks that a machine might do more easily? Do we continue to ask our volunteers to change every instance of TBE to the Now, while an astonishing 150 million lines of text have been corrected, more than 96% of articles have no corrections at all. And of course, more articles are being added all the time. And it also seems that the rate of corrections might be flattening out. The task seems beyond humans alone. We're currently redeveloping our newspapers interface making it more responsive, adding shiny new browse features, and improving the overall performance. And we'll also be introducing some tools for advanced text correction, as we're calling it. Tools that allow users to modify not only the text, but some of the structural elements of the OCR. Inserting new lines, for example. As we investigate opportunities for enrichment of our metadata, the sorts of things that Andy and Dan have talked about, I think we'll also need to think about the work we offer our discovery engineers. Correction, for example, could extend to geocoded place names. Named entity extraction could be integrated with user-defined relationships. Now, this techno-social shift, I think, is also evident at the other end of our pipelines when our aggregated data is consumed and transformed. Except, APIs are not really pipelines, are they? You don't just turn on a tap. You have to ask the API a question. 
our questions interact with the content of the reservoir to shape and colour the flow of data. An API is a tool for transformation. New tools and interfaces explicitly change the nature of our aggregations by carrying their use into different realms, by shifting contexts, by asking new questions. Each new use changes how we see the whole. This is not reuse or recycling. This is remaking. You know, we can dig the tunnels and fill the reservoirs, but it's up to you, the coders, the builders, the developers and the makers, to show us what we've created. The big challenge, of course, is to open up this transformative power to those who have no idea what an API is. People who have important and powerful questions to ask our APIs, but just don't know the language. We need to make sure that the myth of the mega project doesn't blind us to the human dimensions of our undertakings. Let's foster interventions as well as innovations, activists as well as evangelists. Let's make sure our big ideas make space for lots of other little ideas to erupt and to grow. Thanks everyone.